Well, th thank you everybody who's attending. Uh, I started off with this screen, which is a bit complex um, because I wanted to make a couple of points. Uh, one is that restoration has been going on for a long time in one of the stakeholder groups, um, which will be mentioned in this presentation. Uh, and that's in the Falconers, and you can see on the left-hand side here, uh, the slide of a peregrine feeding a chick breeding in captivity for the first time in the early 70s. This was part of a program to restore peregrines, which went on in the United States, Canada, and Germany, and later in Sweden uh, during the 1970s, after the population of these birds had been almost removed by pesticides. Uh, the ones down the bottom come next, and they were in the late 70s, and that was restoring goshawks uh, to um, Britain. These came from Scandinavia, mostly from Finland at that time. Uh, and uh, that's a very young, much younger incarnation of me when I guess I was about the same uh, age as, as Julian Mueller, who will take over from me to present if we get cut off on the uh, video. The top one uh, shows a later program um, run by the United Arab Emirates um, with releasing uh, of falcons and breeding sites of falcons, all restoration programs um, done in falconry. So when was the idea of sustainable use created? IUCN started using the idea in the 1980s. It may go back further if one looks. The Brundtland Report um, picked it up in 1987, and of course CBD made it a major plank uh, of, uh, of, or of the Convention on Biodiversity in 1992. Um, so all those things in English, but it was coined much earlier in Germany. Uh, the German term Nachhaltigkeit uh, was coined for forestry uh, at the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment, uh, I think when there was a lot of concern about um, forests uh, being managed renewably, uh, a lot of people making um, ships out of them. Uh, and so it was very important from, as a defense operation to have renewable forestry. So it's an old thing. But it took a long time to come into the English language. Uh, and this is one of the things that's most important. When new concepts arise, they can take a long time to move across languages. Even nowadays, uh, things take a long, long time to move across different languages and into different cultures. And so although we, we communicate among ourselves in English, uh, this is a major issue if we want to get people around the world, particularly at local level, rather than in the educated levels, which may be educated in English, to understand what is going on. Now, the CBD produced the idea of, of an integration between uh, conservation and use. In other words, it didn't see... Uh, sustainable use as necessarily contributing to conservation, except in the sense that the use needed to go on in order to be sustainable, and so it was conserving the species concerned. And this led to a sort of attitude uh, that people would put up with sustainable use from um, ethnic minorities, indigenous peoples, uh, local communities in some countries, but they'd prefer uh, if there wasn't too much use of wildlife. But IUCN's attitude had always been that this was a conservation tool and that there were provided incentives for people to conserve. So IUCN began an, a sustainable use initiative which eventually produced a sustainable use specialist group. And this group produced a set of principles at White Oak in Florida in 2001, which eventually, after a number of uh, international meetings, became the Addis Ababa principles and guidelines for sustainable use. And they emphasized that use needed to be uh, involve local users, it needed to be equitable and transparent. 
it needed local knowledge and especially it needed adaptive management to work good communication and a wide awareness of the benefits you can sum that all up as local enablement uh, and enlightenment and this was always very important for the sustainable use groups the group i was first involved with was the european sustainable use group there were sustainable use groups in iucn um, around several regions the group in north america was was active the sustainable use group in southern africa was very active and central asia was very active at that time um, and in Europe, each group tended to take on its own particular projects, and certainly the groups that were most active were the ones that had managed to get money um, for projects. So in Europe, um, during the um, first years of the uh, millennium, we ran a project for the European Commission called Governance and Ecosystem Management for Conservation of Biodiversity. And at the same time, we were quite busy with um, producing a charter uh, on hunting and biodiversity in the Berne Convention, which is the convention that preserves species and habitats in Europe and meets in Strasbourg each year. Um, after that, we, we got a second project running to take a theme on of seeing how best to develop a system that could talk between central and local level. And we put it together as a transactional approach, transacting central knowledge, complex knowledge, which could be developed centrally for local knowledge, which could be collated together and help to inform what was then fed back to local. In other words, a sort of virtuous cycle of knowledge, at the same time as going on with two charters with the Berne Convention. At the end of TESS, we launched a, uh, a site, a multilingual site, because we realized that the need to, uh, to communicate to local level was a very important one, because uh, across Europe, for instance, although there was good knowledge of English uh, at a national level, at local levels, it was certainly not the language that most people would choose to work in. There are large numbers of languages in Europe, just as there are in, in most other continents. And this was taken up afterwards by the International Association of Falconry and Conservation of Birds of Prey, which said we'd like to use a similar system in four languages uh, to do some education of people on the sake of falcon, uh, which had just reached uh, a, a point of becoming endangered. And so we then uh, launched another system for, the, for them. Um, at the, uh, in, 19, in, in 2014. In 2014 also, uh, there was a discussion going on about uh, launching a new group in SEM on sustainable use and management of ecosystems. So it was around that time. The system for IEF, uh, they wanted a new one for PerdixNet. And then after that in 2019, Natural Alliance uh, the global version uh, got launched. And one of the things that SEM wanted SUMI to do was to launch uh, a global system and to become a, a truly global op operation for something that had been rather European. Um, the charters are just worth mentioning because they do have a considerable central local uh, application. A charter is something which gives local people rights, strictly speaking, and hence gives central people responsibilities. So it is a, a bottom up and top down operation. Uh, and these ones for fungi also recognized the Berne Convention, uh, um, gave recognition by the Berne Convention of the potential for resource use as an important tool for biodiversity conservation, and then looked at hunting, fishing and gathering uh, to, to put that into context of ecological, economic and socio-cultural sustainability. Um, but this is very much something which involves both governments and local people. And they also start moving by virtue of this towards the previous versions of conservation and protection being very much about don't. Uh, don't kill this, uh, don't uh, plough up 
that grassland. And the idea of a charter was to move towards positive encouragement, encouraging governments to make it easy and to incentivate people to conserve habitats uh, through sustainable use of species to remove aliens when they're present, don't, not just a matter of not releasing them, to restore species and habitats, not just avoiding uh, harming them by protecting of species and areas. And in fact, to treat stakeholders as solutions uh, that could be used to help achieve goals rather than problems to be solved. Now, during the second one of these studies, we also did case studies across Europe and beyond through IUCN uh, to look at what were the factors associated, and we produced a standard set of uh, factors and indicators which were associated with uh, good status of biodiversity, uh, good sustainability, and good sustainability of ecosystem services. And it was quite interesting that uh, we did not find uh, some of the things that people had expected. We didn't find that there was a tremendous uh, benefit uh, of, for instance, communal um, site management. This was quite an unpopular finding at the time. We did actually find uh, that um, if you took uh, private land management and community land management together, they both performed slightly better than, than state management, uh, which was expected. But the things that really came out were that adaptive management, as specified in, in the Addis Ababa principles and guidelines, was very important. Um, and so was knowledge leadership. As far as regulations were concerned, for biodiversity, protection was good. For ecosystem services, it tended to work in the opposite direction. We also looked at the, where the decisions were made, uh, and we looked at local decision making, we looked at national decision making. Obviously, uh, local authorities, lowest level of local government, uh, is taking many more decisions regarding the environment uh, than at national level. Uh, they're working with an, an envelope set at national level. And of course, so are the individual land managers, the farmers, the fishing managers, hunting managers, foresters, reserve managers. And so we asked these people, how many decisions do you make annually? What sort of areas do they uh, uh, cover? Um, and from this, we were able to get to the fact that actually the numbers of, of decisions being made were very variable, but not a lot of difference between uh, the local governments and the area managers. However, when we took area into account, we found that local, local authorities were making decisions about much smaller areas, basically building plots as opposed to fields and forest com compartments uh, and, and larger areas. We also found, of course, that there were far more farmers uh, uh, and hunters in an area than local authorities. So when you took these effects together, you found that there were far more decisions that would affect the environment being taken by the local stakeholders than by the local authority. And this confirmed our, our approach that it was very important for us to be uh, communicating with local level. Now, in the meantime, the, uh, at least in the last 10 years, there have been changes in uh, IUCN's handling of sustainable use. Uh, from a single unitary sustainable use specialist group in Species Survival Commission, a new group was formed to across uh, the Commission for Environmental Economics and Social Policy and SSC, the Sustainable Use and Livelihoods Group, which was specifically intended to look more at the livelihoods and the social issues, as well as the economic issues, of course, which are, are important drivers. Uh, and now the second group in SEM. So there are two groups now which specialize um, in sustainable use within IUCN. SUMI is more about the ecosystems and the communities because uh, we're particularly interested in how people uh, use uh, the um, species as a reason to preserve the ecosystems. Um, both work together, for instance, on the IPES uh, 
uh, thematic assessment. Um, IPBES is the International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and it's running at the moment a thematic assessment on sustainable use of biodiversity, uh, which uh, the reviewers have just been looking at the second order drafts, and uh, hopefully it will be published next year. The emphasis on this is top down and bottom up. And if you look around the world, it really is important that you use other languages because only about 20% of communities speak English on the world as a whole. And in some countries, really communities don't speak English at all. Oops. So it's important to engage local communities. And we found in the last uh, European project that actually people were very good at mapping. Uh, of course, there's a lot of mapping now of species, which goes on at local level, but people are quite good at mapping habitats as well. Uh, and we got some excellent uh, material. And you can use habitat mapping, of course, together with species mapping uh, to start building models uh, and predicting what's going to happen with species populations. It's also important to inform people about the environment. And at the end of the IPES uh, um, assessment, uh, there is a section on scenarios, because just like the IPCC um, produces scenarios for climate, IPES produces uh, scenarios for what might happen um, to sustainable use and conservation from sustainable use. Uh, and I've produced another uh, little scenario here, which has nothing to do with it, um, and is a, a slightly horrifying one, um, if, lest we get too confident. Because if we, there is an, another good reason to involve uh, local communities, and that is this. In de democratic societies, they elect the politicians who make the decisions higher up. So if you don't have the local people actually aligned in their thinking with the politicians, the politicians can take decisions and sign up to uh, these decisions at international conventions, but they may then find that they're out of office again. So how about this for a scenario that the Climate COP26 agrees coal mining ceases in 2024? Some countries wouldn't like this very much. And then let's say at another COP in 2023, uh, there's an agreement for 30% of land to be protected in every state. And in 2024, there's a, an election in an important national country, which becomes the red, not green election, our land, our coal. Mm, that could be problematic because then we might find that progress made in 20 to 23 is reversed. And in 2026, IPC says at the moment, we're on track for four degrees by 2070. And then let's say something like this happens. The world's youth, we've seen the enormous success of Extinction Rebellion, who's to say that something more, even more extreme might not start. So there are very good reasons to get people at local level on, 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 on side with what we wish to see environmentally. So in 2011, as I had mentioned, we launched a, a, a 25 language uh, website. Uh, all we were able to do with it was to put a lot of information on um, best practice through sustainable use. Basically, we went around Europe uh, and got all the people we'd been working with to put in the best projects they could find. And we chose the best ones and we reported them to encourage others to, to try the same sort of thing. And we also asked what sort of thing people would want on a website like this and, and further improved it after that. And here you can see it's in Spanish, as you might expect. It's an important language for, for South America, although this was originally for Spain. Then, as I mentioned, uh, along came the Convention on Migratory Species, the Bonn Convention, uh, with uh, a SACA Global Action Plan and wanted a SACA net. 
And so we started uh, work with uh, CMS uh, and IAF, the Falconers, on this project. Um, and we needed to handle a, a lot of languages we hadn't had to cope with in Europe. We'd coped with Russian in, in Europe, but the languages wanted also were to include Arabic uh, and uh, Persian, as spoken in Iran, um, and also Pashto uh, for um, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we found we needed to use right to left languages. This is a whole new set of issues when you, it comes to translating. It's a whole new set of issues when you want diagrams because we wanted diagrams uh, that could be language specific. And also we wanted links on mobile phones so that we could survey because we realized at this early stage uh, in was where were we 2014 then that mobile phones were becoming the way for which, in which a lot of people um, particularly in the areas we were seeking to address across central asia were actually using mobile phones to access the internet they were not using computers so we needed to be to have everything working properly on mobile phones as well the first system uh, was fairly straightforward it just linked the uh, multilingual site uh, to a smartphone survey in the languages concerned. And that actually worked very well. We had a tremendous um, uptake, uh, particularly where uh, people who'd done the translation in the countries reached out on social media. For instance, in uh, Pakistan, we had an excellent response to the survey. Um, in Pashto, I think uh, most people hadn't um, bothered to go to Pashto. In fact, Microsoft didn't even support it. So we had quite a, a, a game uh, getting the language to work across the various um, um, parts of the system. And then, as I said, um, IEF was interested in starting a, a system to help with language uh, to help with agriculture. Um, the very strong intensification of agriculture in Europe had, had badly affected one of the species that falconers like, like to hunt, the grey partridge, and become really rare in some areas. So uh, we started Perdixnet as well. And this we changed because we realized that having started a central site, we needed to talk to things in each country because each country had slightly different laws. It had slightly different issues with agriculture, ways in which, for instance, the common agricultural um, um, policy was implemented. Uh, it had uh, different ecology uh, overall, and it had different things that people were interested in. Uh, so here you can see the German site, uh, local site, which was linked to, uh, and here the English one, uh, which was uh, very different. Uh, there are sites in, in other partridge languages now, but um, mainly uh, we moved on to other things. Oh, going back to this one, we also um, set up a way in which all these sites could be linked because they were all part of one system. And you can see the similarities in, in the outlook between these satellites. They could also be linked up across them so that if you've got a lot of, uh, of sites with one language, you can put one page uh, across them from just one editing center. And that's very good for organizing projects. And you can see here on the Perdix UK site and on the site of a um, particular um, bed and breakfast um, operation, which is local here, uh, the same site is available. Now, it's very important to realize that any networking like this is not just a matter of the, the software, if you like the technology, and the hardware, in, in fact, that it goes with as well. But it's also the people, because once you start running national sites, you are needing to organize people as well. So a network is also a network of people running the sites as well as the hardware. And this is very important. And people like to get together. And you can see the launch of the Perdixnet in Vienna, the relaunch of, of uh, the Seikernet. Uh, here in Abu Dhabi in 2019. So we found that our initial system, which had been fairly simple, uh, 
actually had become really quite complex. We'd got satellites, we'd got a hub, we could still run survey centrally, uh, we could feed science information uh, on a different site, and we could also, if we wanted to, because all these sites were linked together, we could feed uh, management systems into them. For instance, we were very interested in a, in a mark and release system uh, for monitoring staker populations and po possibly monitoring trade. It's not been built yet, but it's been designed. Uh, and But there is all sorts of stuff which you could uh, feed down there, for instance, systems uh, for guiding you from a map to uh, manage your agriculture in a way more sympathetic to biodiversity. Uh, and that's another system, an intelligent GIS that we would we would like to do. So we've got these glints in our eyes, which uh, could happen if we get going further and get more support. So what have we done? Well, we've built a system and with the, we looked around and said, we've built a system that networks people both vertically and horizontally. What else is there? are out there that does this. And we found there isn't very much in the civic sector at all. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Microsoft, they all do the, uh, a degree of networking. But actually, if you look at Facebook and Twitter, uh, they're, they're, they are uh, tending to work within languages, where we are also trying to work across languages uh, to uh, transfer concepts and facts rapidly so that it doesn't take a couple of hundred years uh, or more for um, the concept of sustainable use to, to transfer uh, from uh, Germany to, uh, to elsewhere. We don't have that sort of time for climate change. And that's what we've, we're trying to do now in, in, uh, in SUMI with a lot of support from the International Association of Falconry. They are enormously helpful as a stakeholder uh, because not only do they have UNESCO approval uh, as an intangible cultural heritage, but they also have a network of clubs uh, which are organized on, uh, on democratic principles in about 90 countries. Uh, and that's really, really helpful because if we don't have a volunteer in SUMI, we can go to them and say, can you help find us as someone who's interested in conservation and knows enough to do the translation? And that's been extremely helpful as we've been moving um, outside Europe. And thus we launched Natural Alliance in April, 2019. And the oval red on the under the mission statement shows where you can click. We've moved the, the link so that you can just use this as a, as a signpost to your local uh, site. And we have local sites uh, now in more than 30 uh, locations around the world. Uh, some of them are more advanced than others, but they're developing. Uh, do have a look at them. They, we've put material on climate change. We've put material on COVID on because it has relevance to sustainable use. This is the Hindi site. There are actually 40 languages. And the intention is to attract local people, uh, to inform them, uh, perhaps also to survey. Uh, we're not um, as um, hubristic as to think we might try and do global pro projects yet. We'd certainly need a lot more money to do that. We've had a lot of help uh, from people uh, around the world to do this. And in fact, it wouldn't be possible without a network of people who want to get involved, want to translate, uh, want to check translations. That's often sometimes quite important uh, and so on. And you need expert translators like this. And uh, the people doing this have been doing it at uh, ridiculously uh, low prices. Basically, we, we give them enough to enable them to get to a meeting when a meeting should come along. So, so and that helps everybody to get together, to get to know each other uh, and to form something of a, a community of interest. When you're running a system like this, it's very important to keep it simple. You have to translate, first of all, the science into simple language. And we notionally ask people to think that they were talking to a 16 year old, perhaps the daughter of a local farmer 
who might then persuade her dad to make some changes. And it makes translation easiest too, if you use simple unambiguous text. I don't think we've achieved it yet. If you look at Natural Alliance, uh, yes, the intelligent 16 year olds will look at it and they, they will tell you, well, some of this is a bit complex. So I don't think we've quite got there yet, but we're trying to move in that direction. It does put some constraints on the system. If you show our, our sites to uh, the communications team in an organization, they'll say, oh, we could build a much better site than that, much more glitzy and attractive. Uh, but there are some constraints if you're transmitting, translating something, you have to get it so that it can work in the different languages in a fairly standard way. And of course, the social technology is just as important as, as anything else to build up those relationships uh, across the different parts of the world. And also to start discussion groups, as we're hoping to do uh, shortly, working in the different languages too, because only that way will we start to get uh, people um, really understanding what the concepts mean throughout the countries transmitting on social media and we found that this is by far and away the best most effective way when we started Sekanet, uh, we found uh, that suddenly it was trending in iran and we could detect this on the google analytics uh, and it turned out that the um, person who'd be doing the translating there um, was starting a small consultant consultancy of his own and he fancied um, using our site uh, to improve his visibility personally uh, and uh, he'd been blogging about it like mad and and it trended and trended <laughs> very interesting you need people to 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 talk about the sites so what have we what have we learned what are the conclusions well the networks with multilingual hubs linked to local satellites can transfer ideas and best practice rapidly horizontally as well as vertically it's it's a good way to get messages across they potentially can help bottom up um, networking uh, bottom up um, activities particularly i think for restoration and and that's why uh, I, I think um, it's very good to give this talk because as we move into the uh, CBD's decade of restoration, uh, we need to be able to start those activities and ideally by helping to pro produce decision support tools which can do this. Bottom up and top down is the spirit of the charters developed in Europe. And such thinking is also important for ecosystem services, uh, particularly nature-based solutions. There are IUCN members who benefit from using wild resources, uh, such as falconers, hunters, uh, not so many angling groups. They seem to, to be fairly self-contained uh, and virtually no uh, foraging groups, which is a great shame. It would be good if we could get those organized because the, it's quite interesting. If you look at falconers are a tiny, tiny minority. Uh, hunters uh, in uh, Europe, uh, there are about 7 million of them. If you look at uh, the numbers of anglers, there are about 24 million of those. So something like three times as many um, anglers as hunters. If you look at people who are foraging, you get about three times as many again. Uh, and so you get to up to around 60 to 80 million people who are routinely foraging and also coming out of the towns to pick mushrooms in the countryside. And so it's really important to reach out to these people. Unfortunately, the, the one, people with the smallest numbers tend to be the best organized, possibly because they've been under, under protection and uh, under pressure from protection groups to explain themselves. Uh, and we really need to get the, uh, everybody who's engaged in, in sustainable use organized. Although expert translation keeps the cost down, it's quite challenging to combine the social and technological development and i'm not saying that we've got a, a system yet which will run sites effectively and broadcast in local levels we're only just starting that stage we've certainly got sites uh, out in the countries 
uh, but bringing the bulk of the population to visit them such that they're trending everywhere. No, are we going to achieve that and how? We're still working on it. And for that purpose, SUMI, the Sustainable Use and Management of Ecosystems Group, as well as having help from SULI uh, in the uh, cross SSD and C seats, would very much like help from other CM groups uh, to use the system. And to, if you have projects that you're getting going, we'd be very glad to, to help and work with you on this sort of thing. So uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, there are uh, links shown. I don't think they're live on the uh, on the PowerPoint, but they can be later on the on the um, thing that's given around, so that you can have a look at the networks if you haven't had a chance to do so already. And so um, I'll stop sharing my screen, Todd and hand, uh, Brock, and I'll hand back to you. Great, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, I found this fascinating. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, all your efforts. Um, just so people know, uh, the links referred to in, in the PowerPoint, I will make available on the CEM um, restoration webinar page um, as, as a PDF. So you can uh, get that as well. Um, I also posted in the chat um, a, a link to the uh, Natural Alliance. So. Um, uh, please type your questions into the question and answer section um, and we can work our way through those. Um, I do have uh, one question here so far. Uh, what are the different ways one can contribute and how, um, whether it be your thematic group, um, just maybe just some suggestions on how people can um, uh, learn more and, and help? <clears throat> Well, there are a number of ways. Um, we're always looking for translators. Um, we tend to keep our translators, but if we can share the load among them, that makes it much easier. Although we provide some um, for the initial translation of a, of a, of a site, uh, we have been providing uh, 100 uh, euros uh, for the whole translation, which is a very poor payment. Um, up beyond that, we hope to keep these as, as voluntary operations where people will be helped to get to meetings as and when we can. Um, so help with translation is very important. Help with editing local sites, that's going to be important too. And we, the need is to set up groups to run each, each um, uh, local site uh, with a, uh, an editor-in-chief who, who will um, keep in touch with us and make sure that the content is checked because uh, these sites are, are logoed by IUCN and, or Natural Alliances anyway, it's, an, it's a, a, a CM operation for, for IUCN and we have to make sure that, that the standard of material is, is high. So anybody who would like to help uh, get in touch with me, please. Um, my email is, I hope, on the bottom of the thing. I'm not sure if it is, um, but if not, um, perhaps uh, Brock will very kindly put it on the, um, on the sheet that goes, goes around afterwards. Yes, I'm posting that into the chat right now, if that's okay. I have another question here. Uh, can we think of utilizing the museums or non-formal education inst institutions to publicize these efforts in restoration and IUCN efforts to reach a wider audience? Thank you. That's a, that's a good question. We should use everything. Uh, and there will be some training uh, for when we form the groups. Uh, we have uh, a journalist who's also an ecologist in, in the UK uh, at uh, Cambridge. He works across Cambridge and, and, and um, Canterbury and Kent, uh, Dr. Keith Somerville. Uh, and he's going to help provide some training. Actually, uh, Julian Muller, uh, who was on standby in case my internet went down to take over from me, who's a, a co-author of, of this, uh, will also be um, helping to handle this. Uh, so um, it will be, uh, it's important for everybody to get in touch. It's a big job, this, and we are planning to get uh, training going 
but we're only just starting it because we've only just finished the rollout of the first simple sites, which were of a standard design. Uh, they've given training in setting up the sites and also uh, in, in the uh, simple concepts, but we've got a tremendous amount of work to do if we're going to give the support we need. At the moment, it's uh, not entirely voluntary in the sense that we've got a couple of days a week of, of Julian's uh, time to help. So um, we will be getting on with this soon, starting with the most abundant languages. Julian fortunately speaks Spanish and German. He's from Chile in, in origin. Uh, and so a Spanish we can get going very quickly. Um, French and Russian will be important ones to get going as well, because they cover a lot of important countries together with Spanish. Great. Um... I have another question here. This came in a little bit earlier. Let me find it again. Um, so um, first a comment, then a question about it. Uh, usually a survey to get people observations on their participation. The ICT surveys have a limitation on getting descriptive information because of the structure of the question in the system. Um, do you have any insights on how such a limitation may be overcome when, when you're using this multi uh, lingual approach. Any, any lessons learned from that? I lost the audio at the beginning of, of, of that, so I, I understood how you uh, that you wanted advice on how you could structure it, but I wasn't quite sure what the I heard the word survey, but that was about all. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, within surveys, and you're trying to get people's opinions and, and um, a, a pulse of a community um, in different languages. Is there any? Um, uh, limitation, how, how limitations of the structuring of the questions can be overcome? It's, it's really interesting, that one. Um, fortunately, in, in uh, the group we work with, um, SULI, the Sustainable Use and Livelihoods Group, we have a lot of people uh, from CISP who have uh, training um, in, uh, in the social sciences. And indeed, uh, Julian uh, is, uh, has uh, a master's in, in political sciences. It's very uh, challenging to get this right. Um, and we take a long time when we're putting a questionnaire together to, to try and get the words right. Uh, we've been finding that uh, um, as we've moved outside Europe, um, we start to get into, it becomes even more challenging because within Europe, uh, we tend to think of things, there's been a certain amount of convergence as a result of, of, of all working together, for instance, in the European uh, Union, that's probably helped. Um, but as you move away from Europe, it gets more and more challenging. And, and we find even that some words uh, 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 that we take for granted uh, are not straightforward in, the, in their use. So um, yes, quest doing any form of survey is very difficult. Surveys are great for getting people to come to a, a site, but you've got to do, be very careful as you, you set it up um, in the first place. Otherwise you're going to get subtly different responses from different countries for, for reasons that depend on language. So, so true. Uh, the art of evaluation. Um, it, it's, it's social, but you're also trying to blend it in the science. Um, definitely. Um, another question here. Um, there are already 40 languages in the list, as you told. Um, this participant asked, can we get auto translation tools if anybody wanted to upload information to the site? <laughs> Ah, wonderful. Um, yes, we've used Google Translate and for some languages it's jolly good. Um, if you want to translate from French to English, it's it's not bad. Uh, German to English is pretty good. I can manage some of those languages so I can check it as I go along. Uh, I'm told uh, that some of the languages that I can't do, uh, it gets problematic even if you're doing simple things like business talk and if you start getting into um, ecology and environmental issues it really loses it so this is why uh, expert translations are so important uh, some of them do ad admit to using google translate to help them uh, but we we check translation. We all, we try and get a secondary check on it, and so uh, stuff doesn't go through uh, that's uh, just been done by, for instance, Google Translate. 
obviously in time, in 20 years time, perhaps, we're going to have systems that really are really good at this. Uh, and the, the reason I think this is going to happen is I've just been starting to use some um, Google um, um, Lens for identifying uh, some bugs and butterflies and moths and things. And it's pretty good. So I think we're, we're going to get round this issue and we may not eventually need translators, but we still need people to translate the concepts that have not been translated across languages. And the world we're living in now environmentally, these concepts are coming along all the time. Things like tipping points, for instance, we had to produce a glossary uh, item because it, we, when we translate, we get people to flag up words that are really problematic for them. We hope there won't be too many, but tipping points came out as one. Uh, and we, we had to, to produce a glossary for, for about 10 words when we did um, natural alliance so that people could actually cope. You're not going to find that happening very quickly, or at least ideally, if we can converge thinking on the environment so that everybody realizes the problems with, with climate change across the world in 10 years time at local level. Wow, that would be really nice. But I don't think we've got time to wait for the translation software to be good enough. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, things are getting better, but you're always going to need that, that translation, that the uh, the person involved there, um, especially here uh, now. Um, quick little question here. Is there any focus on documentation of traditional local knowledge of local communities? Um, maybe I could rephrase that, but um, is there any focus on uh, local knowledge, local traditional knowledge um, in, in your efforts? Yes, in, 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 traditional and local knowledge. Yes, it's, it's so important. Uh, TLC, it's TLK, it's, it's very important. And that's why we started off, uh, the idea was to be transactional. Our second um, project with uh, EU funding was to design a system to, to do this, to exchange local knowledge from mapping, uh, for example, uh, with um, central knowledge. Um, the knowledge on uh, how to manage sustainable use a lot of it is uh, uh, particularly uh, among indigenous cultures that have, uh, uh, have by definition been in areas acting sustainably for a long time. Um, it's, uh, it's part of their ethos. Uh, and some of them, I, it was interesting uh, uh, story that I was reading not long ago uh, of one group that asked about sustainability and it said, we have to be sustainable it sh because we're here. We are by definition sustainable. And because we're at subsistence level, that is the case. And that sort of knowledge is very important to bring in. Uh, and having reviewed, been right through the uh, assessment, and although none of it can be shared because it's all highly confidential, uh, there's some really good thinking going in on that into that report which is really really quite exciting uh, and I think that's going to stimulate a, a lot of projects in in uh, in the next decade so yes deeply terribly important uh, and we're not we're not really addressing it at the moment getting maps made of local areas doesn't go far enough uh, there is a huge amount of management information to come in so I so I guess for anybody uh, watching who was uh, very interested in, in, in the work that you do and a multilingual approach. Um, and you happen to work with uh, local communities and traditional knowledge. Um, I guess try to find a way to get these included in, in with, with, with those that you work with uh, locally. So um, hopefully they, they learned a little bit from you here. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask, are there any languages you have found particularly difficult or just, uh, and why in your efforts? 
Well, once you get into different scripts, uh, I am, it, it is really challenging. Sometimes we have to make minor modifications to translations, for instance, to change a link or something like that. And it really, it, it becomes really difficult then. Um, I, I can handle um, the European languages and, and Russian uh, Cyrillic script for that. But once you get into right to left languages and Sanskrit based languages, uh, I'm, I'm a bit lost. And that's why we particularly need to have strong groups uh, working in those uh, different language areas who can handle that sort of thing. It's, it, we can't do it all uh, centrally. We can, we can manage centrally um, to, to keep the system going, uh, but it's not gonna work without um, having active groups in the, in, the, in the different regions, particularly the different language regions. Uh, I had a question along these lines and then somebody else did as well. Um, and this is on the, the bottom-up approach. Um, so uh, I guess kind of a two-parter, speaking of the, the bottom-up approach, do you have any suggestions? Because you have a lot of people online who work in varying levels of governance, nonprofits, academia, um, in, involved in this conservation work in general. Um, do you have any suggestions for those online today uh, tuning in that, that wish to include a more multilingual approach to their work? Any, any lessons learned? If somebody wants to start including more languages uh, in their daily uh, or monthly work? I would encourage it. I think one of the things that's happened since we started doing this, particularly since one of the, one of the great things is that everybody's rather competitive uh, and having competition for conservation is a really good thing. And so when the Faulkners uh, started doing things in different languages, uh, the uh, hunters in Europe started doing the same thing too. And when we started Natural Alliance, uh, we noticed that um, we actually put in a motion to uh, WCC7 on, on, uh, on um, um, communicating in different languages. And suddenly uh, we were told, well, actually I use is doing this. And, and since almost at the same time, there's been a huge amount of, of putting all the um, IUCN material into um, French and Spanish at least. I think we need to go much further than that. It's a good start. But once uh, there is another group on communities in your part of the world, in Canada, north of you anyway, um, which uh, is very good at going into other languages. And this is really starting to take off. I, I see language buttons. I really look for these now because we, we, we love it because when we go to um, in Natural Alliance, we can put language specific links in. Uh, so um, Wikipedia, for instance, we found that climate change was uh, uh, considered on Wikipedia in about 15 languages. And so we linked in the particular languages uh, to Wikipedia on, on climate change. Um, unfortunately, once we got down to things, as I mentioned, tipping points, very, very, very little. But if we can get things in, in other languages, it's terrific. And if people say, oh, well, we don't want them just to be doing it. Um, we want to put our point across about protected areas and things in different languages. Terrific. Go for it. Uh, and we'll link you in once you've done it. Great. Um, so this is a little bit of a crowdsourcing. Uh, do you have a list of languages that you need the most help with right now? <laughs> we have, we're Top out five. of cash at the moment for paying the uh, for paying the um, uh, hundred euros. Um, we will have to go back to our sponsors for that because this is an, an expensive year with the, trying to get somebody to to um, Marseille. Um, but um, yeah, we can. We we've got fifty four. We could do on the site at the moment. Um, and so we'd um, we'd quite like to get those down. Um, I can produce a, a, a list of them. Um, and in fact, I, if you want, I can. If you want to share my screen again briefly, can we do that? And I'll I'll show you. I think here we are. And here you can see in. Uh, and mm. if I make this full size, you'll see it. Probably see it better. Yeah. You can see a full list of languages and you can see the ones that we, we oh, I'd love to get Malagasy on. That would be good. We're, we're still looking for Isi Zulu. 
Um, some of them, unfortunately, are not in Latin script. I can see Belarus there and uh, and Serbia, and uh, but the there's a few there that I don't know what they what they are. So. Um, but the people, if there are any of you out there who can read those red languages and can translate into them, please, please get in touch with me and, and we'll certainly find, find a little reward for, for the translation. This is perfect. So this is on the Natural Alliance webpage. Uh, it's not because the red ones are not there. Um, and so uh, grab, grab a screenshot uh, if, you, if you need one. Okay. Um, because it's uh, this is the editor and I have to log in to do that and which I've done. Okay, yeah. So hey, look at these red languages and if you know anybody who's interested in helping out, um, those are the ones we're shooting for right now. Uh, need to start filling in all the holes. Um, uh, I know that we're coming to time. It's one o'clock now. Um, if anybody wants to leave, it's perfectly fine now. I just wanted to um, throw another question out here for you. Um, and it's, uh, it was in the questions box asked a little bit earlier. Um, and it has to do with the, the top down and bottom up. Um, in your mind, what is the best way to link bottom up results and top down results about restoration, uh, sort of bridging that gap? Well, we reckoned we needed a, a, a transactional system, but what we were going to focus on within that transactional system was GIS. Uh, and that's why we wanted an intelligent GIS to help people at local level, because basically, if you can get everybody to map at local level, it'll integrate to national level and above. And, and so we reckon that mapping is, is so easy. And I'm, oh, wow, I'm <laughs> Khmer Isizulu. Thank you, people who are, who are contacting me. This is brilliant. Yes, send um, an email. Please do email me and, and get in touch. Um, these, these are languages we really, really want. Um, so, um, yeah, it, 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 the other nice thing about mapping is it's pictorial and people can work their way around it without very much instructions. The icons, for instance, for moving around, navigating around mapping systems are really good. And we, we did a mapping system, a multilingual one, uh, but because we didn't get the money to follow on uh, with the project afterwards and build this system, um, that's all gone, gone by the way. And there, there may be good multilingual mapping tools out there now, which we could, which we could engage engage with. But what do you think, Brock? I mean, you know, you're, you're interested in GIS too. Uh, and the other beauty about, about doing this from top down as well as bottom up is that where you have gaps, you can use the remote sensing uh, to fill in the gaps because um, the remote sensing will give you mapping down to, to 10 meters now. Uh, and although you can go to one meter or so at, uh, at, at local level um, with people mapping on the ground, uh, these are technologies which one can, just asking to be brought together more effectively. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, at, if, if we can look at local maps and see change over time, just that visual is so effective just to, just to see it. Um, just the, a, a time lapse, a, cha a change detection um, locally, I, I think that it speaks volumes um, to those who are best to best able to make those local decisions and decision makers uh, at that level. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Someone asked here, um, what was the multilingual mapping system that you used or developed before? So, I, I guess you had one before that you were working on. Uh, yes, we we have one. We could revive it um, and. It would be be usable, but um, I suspect there are uh, good systems out there already. Um, the, one of the problems with everything we do with mapping has been that once you um, and we do quite a lot of uh, of, of work on this for um, um, handling modeling, um, working with radio tagged animals, and so on and so forth. 
um, Esri provides a, a basis for doing it. And this is fine for people in universities because the university is paying the Esri subscription, which is quite large. But if you want people to do it in local communities and so on, it's no good. Uh, and yet um, this makes it hard to fund this sort of stuff. Uh, and um, so we we couldn't go on with 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 that with that tool. It's still there. It could be revived. It would need a lot of revamping now because it's ten years old. Yeah, I mean uh, another one. QGIS being open source, uh, Quantum GIS. Yes, yes, yeah. Out. We've we, we've identified that as probably where we'd go if we were going to do this. But I don't know if it's multilingual. You know, I need to look into that as well. Um, well, I know that it is the end of your week. It is the end of your Friday. Um, and I'm sure you're looking forward to enjoying your weekend. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'll send you a transcript of the chat because in that chat, you had a couple of people offering up their emails, uh, other information on things, uh, but as, as well as being versed in some of these languages uh, to help with your efforts. So I'll make sure that you get that. Uh, but please, those who also, um, I put the link to Robert's email in the chat so you can reach out to him directly as well. Um, so with that, and from Kara and myself, we really appreciate you coming in and telling us uh, about your work and, and how it can be used by the restoration professionals and enthusiasts online here today. Well, Brock, thank you for organizing these seminars because this is not a little task that you've taken on as well. It, it's a very important big one that serves, serves many of us. And thank you to everybody who's attended and, and stayed till the bitter end. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll be in touch and I will post this uh, on, on the, uh, the webpage and the YouTube playlist within a week. Uh, next month, please uh, join us where we're going to talk about the, uh, global for the third global forum on restoration that happened recently as an update on everything that happened and what we came to uh, agreement on. So um, please tune in next week where Karen and I will cover a lot of that. And thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Brock. Thank you, Karen. Have a nice weekend, everybody.